I'm fairly young. Uh, and for those of you who were with us, we have uh, coverage, I think, today. Ooh, excuse me. In China Daily, so we got covered uh, in the event last night. So if you were there, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, so last night, uh, we had a chance to be with our founders. And if you have this picture, it's kind of nice that there were four of us uh, who were there 25 years later. Um, I think that's quite, quite something. Uh, and of course, talked about the vision of IM Bay, uh, responding to the needs of, of, of uh, the US-China relationship and also uh, the interests of Americans, uh, Ch Chinese Americans, to be able to fully participate and fairly participate in the, uh, in, 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 in the American uh, uh, economy and, and society. And those are the same objectives we've held all these 25 years. So it is unchanged. And so we had a meeting yesterday with the press. And so they said, well, 25 years is a long time. And we said, yes, we've had the same goal. They said, so, so what have you done? <laughs> well, OK. So we talked about what it meant for this dual mission. And when we talked about, um, let's say, ensuring the fair participation and free participation of, of uh, Chinese Americans in American society, um, one of the cases that we were very involved in was uh, the Wen Ho Lee case, who was, as you know, falsely accused of espionage and actually put into chain in, in, uh, in, in prison for quite a long time. And the committee, having uh, existed at that time, played a very important role uh, behind the scenes, networking through our members who were in many, many different positions in the, in the military, in the legal system, being able to access the government. And uh, I think that it ultimately, as you know, turned out that it was a false charge. Uh, he was exonerated. And actually, President Clinton apologized, as did the New York Times, which had made a great case of pursuing this uh, as something that was definite that Wen Ho Lee was a spy when, in fact, and they kind of had it mixed up because actually he was from Taiwan. They said that he was doing stuff for China. But anyway, it was one of those sad cases where an individual really uh, suffered a great deal and uh, unfairly. But I guess it is part of America that it was corrected. And I think the Committee 100 was very proud to have been a small part of making sure that that did happen. We have had other instances similar to that, to that when uh, CBS on national television had a show that talked about spying, underground spying, long-term spying. They called them, I think, under undersea spies that are planted by China. And it ended the program by saying, so if you have a neighbor, he may be a spy. Well, this was hugely unfair, obviously. And we did manage through our various uh, contacts to get CBS actually for once to do an on-air apology and to retract that. And then, of course, there was the case of the friendly fire case where uh, an American aircraft fired on another aircraft by mistake. But when the prosecution came out, it was only a Chinese American, uh, Captain Wong, who was held responsible, although there was a crew of 10 on the plane. And again, that ultimately came uh, to a good end. So unfortunately, things like this do happen. They will happen again, I'm sure. And I think that the committee, in its mission, to try to make sure that Chinese Americans have every opportunity and will be fairly given every opportunity, that we will be some part of hopefully helping to address that together with other organizations so that all Chinese Americans can prosper and succeed in this country on an equal basis. On the international basis, clearly the need for uh, our mission, that is to increase understanding between the peoples of the United States and China and to foster better future relations, uh, better relations on common interest uh, for a common future, as we heard from Dr. Kissinger, uh, is certainly important and of increasing importance today. And certainly we have tried, uh, as a small organization, to make that one of our missions uh, in whatever ways that we can. Some of the things we've done is we've co conducted major studies of American attitudes towards China and Chinese attitudes towards America, major studies which have been published and shared uh, across the board. We've worked with Washington, 
with the White House, with uh, Congress, uh, with, uh, I remember we had, before one of the new ambassadors, Ambassador Sasser, went to China. We had a meeting with him and he said, I've been in Congress 13 years and I've never met anybody at that time from the People's Republic. So he was very, very interested and, and, <clears throat> and ultimately, as you know, he was responsible for the first trip of Bill Clinton to China. And, and as Americans, we have the privilege of being able to contact and, and uh, the, American, uh, the American government and, and American leadership, but also because of our Chinese heritage, we have been able to contact leadership in China as well as in Taiwan. So we have visited just most recently last year with the leadership in Taiwan, as we have over the years, I think starting with Li Tenghui uh, and all the way to last year with Ma Ying-jeou. And in Beijing, we have made our annual visits there and held events there and been very welcomed, starting with uh, President uh, Jiang Zemin and then most recently last year, uh, seeing uh, Premier Li Keqiang and State Councilors Yang and Yu Sunsun. So we hope that over these years, we have kept with our mission, but also perhaps played a role in helping to advance that mission. Interestingly, there are many, many wonderful organizations that are focused on US-China relations, National Committee and Kissinger Associates and, and the Asia Society, et cetera. But we are the only organizations made up of Chinese Americans. And so one of the interesting side things that happen is that when we have our meetings in, those, in, in China, for example, the meetings are held in Chinese. And we are told by the staff that it creates a different mood for the meetings. And so perhaps that's something that, that we have as an advantage uh, in, in these meetings in terms of sharing perspectives. But the task remains, and of course these, these goals will not go away, and the issues of certainly both Chinese American participation in American society and the issues of better relations and bridging understanding between US and China will continue. And that of course brings me to our speaker today, our keynote speaker, who is perhaps the embodiment of helping to bridge that understanding between the United States and China. Our ambassador, Zhang Qiyue, the consul general from uh, China to New York City. But interestingly, she's not just responsible for New York City, which I really didn't realize before, but her footprint includes all of New England and New Jersey and Pennsylvania and all the way to Ohio. So she is a great uh, 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 kind of area in which she can bring her great skills to bear. Uh, she also has a very unusual background in the sense that as a teenager, Ambassador Zhang actually lived in the United States. And so she studied in the United States and lived with an American family in the United States. So certainly in her background, she embodies somebody who understands both sides and can bring great understanding, I think, uniquely to this particular role that she speaks. As you know, she was, uh, she was also uh, the foreign affairs spokesperson. And I hear from uh, people in, in China that as the foreign uh, ministry spokesman for, I think, six years, uh, she was the model for that role and uh, uh, has been the standard by which every other person who's followed her has had to try to reach. So we're very privileged today uh, to have Madam Zhang uh, to, to be our speaker today, but also more importantly, to be our Consul General in the New York area and this larger area. And I guess we should also remember that this is a great example of China making use of women power. So we're delighted to have her. And uh, Zhang Chia, I would like to bring you up now to address our group. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Shirley. <clears throat> Please continue to eat. Uh, I don't want it to uh, cut your lunch short. Uh, well, dear honorable members of the Committee of 100 and distinguished guests and friends, it is really an honor and a pleasure for me to speak 
in front of such a distinguished crowd. And uh, once again, my warm congratulations to the C100 of, on your remarkable efforts. I think over the past 25 years, you have worked tirelessly in many fields and across the United States to promote exchanges between our two great nations. And with your collective wealth of experience, knowledge, and resources, you have really pushed forward China-US relations to the, to the benefit of our two peoples. Last night's gala was really a celebration of your devotion and commitment to this cause. I must say that I'm quite touched by many of the stories that I heard last night. I learned the little bit of a history of uh, the Committee 100 and very much touched by your courage and tenacity to foster greater mutual understanding and, and uh, setting up a constructive dialogue between our two countries, even in trying times. I think it's always easy when things are going smoothly, but in trying times and un under difficult circumstances, to have you there continuously working with this relationship, I think that's something that you have won great respect for, from our leaders, from our people in China. So you are really a constant source of inspiration to all of us and to me as I'm starting my new job. Thank you. I am actually four months into this job. As I deal with this broad spectrum of bilateral issues every day, I cannot help but compare where we are now with where we were 40 years ago. I first came to New York in 1974 as one of the five middle school students from New China. This actually um, took place in the wake of the Nixon and Kissinger trip. When we first arrived, I think you, know, you can imagine this was 40 years ago without diplomatic relations, without any contact between the United States and China. We were probably seen as crash-landed Martians or aliens, as uh, Joe Wang mentioned uh, last night. And um, well, I did not think I was an alien, but people, I think, looked at us quite differently and uh, always had a lot of questions in mind. Uh, at that time, I felt that, you know, of course, I was very different uh, from the average American kid. Uh, I came with no word of English. And I, I wore, at that time, braids. Uh, so at that time, it wasn't that fashion uh, to wear uh, braids, but I insisted in having those braids. And I wasn't you know, used to, or I haven't really uh, seen this kind of food, like cheese was, felt, to me, it felt like some smelly tofu. <laughs> And I also wanted just to tell you a little story that, you know, how I perceive the, my American friends or my peers, you know, I, because at that time we were, you know, from New China, so my teachers, my students, fellow students had a lot of questions on their minds. So they, they wanted to ask us or ask me about this or that. But because I came with no word of English, I couldn't really explain. Uh, so I remember there was this one girl who had a lot of questions on her mind. So every time she sees me, she bursts out with some question. And she would say, ah, this is a, she started to, you know, to, to ask me this question. And then I looked in really puzzlement. And she realized that I, I don't really understand. And she said, oh, forget it. And then the second time she came around and she had another question, you know, she, she started to, 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 to say, uh, say this in, a, in a loud. And then she realized again that I couldn't answer her and she said, oh, forget it. So, you know, this word, you know, kept coming back to me. And then being a very serious student, I had, a li I had a dictionary with me all the time in school. So after hearing this word, you know, forget, I tried to look up the word in the, in the dictionary. And it says that, you know, you don't have a memory of something. And I started to wonder, I said, what is going on here? You know, why when students come up to me and ask me a question, they forget about what they 
<laughs> they have wanted to ask, you know, was it because of me or anything else? So this is to give you a feeling that, you know, we, we did sometimes feel like a little bit alien uh, in school. But this was a story, you know. And also, at that time, in, in the school that uh, we went to, the only Chinese food that the school served was chicken chow mein. And, and when we had chicken chow mein in the cafeteria, I remember my, my friends would say, hey, Qiyue, we're going to have Chinese food. And I said, yes. You know, so I looked at the chicken chow mein, and it's something that I don't really recognize and never heard of. <laughs> And uh, so that was really, I felt that was very strange. Even the Chinese food seemed to be uh, different. Uh, <clears throat> but that was then. I think today, you know, it, hardly need me to say that nearly half a million of Chinese, you know, even in New York, we, have, we find about a half a million Chinese living in New York. And uh, from what I heard is that there is a flight um, actually between China and the United States every 24 minutes. And I know uh, Mr. Chen Guoqing is not here. I know the Hainan. Uh, oh, you're here. I didn't see you. <laughs> I know that Hainan Airline wants to open more uh, flights. So I think very soon we'll probably have a flight between our two countries every 15 minutes. And uh, I hope so. And uh, I, from what I hear, you know, the numbers are never really correct. But from what I hear is that about 10,000 people travel across the Pacific every day. And in fact, also as far as the local Chinese communities are concerned, uh, the Chinese are becoming the fastest growing community in the city, and many of whom are now um, having their homes in New York. And last year, actually, China was the fourth biggest source of visitors to New York after the United Kingdom, Canada, and Brazil. And there are also some numbers saying that uh, the Chinese tourists are already number three uh, in New York. I think this is uh, still growing very fast. The number of visitors is growing so fast that given the extension of travel and business visas from one to 10 years since last uh, November. And I can see that from the long queues outside of my consulate. You know, my <laughs> we are constantly under great pressure because you see a long queues every morning and every afternoon, and I get a lot of uh, pressure from that. You know, we're trying to, to, to quicken up the process. Today, China-U.S. bilateral relations have performed even the most optimistic predictions when President Nixon and Dr. Kissinger visited China in 1972. China is really the fastest expanding export market for the United States. We are expected to become each other's largest trading partners by roughly 2022, with the uh, US exports to China projected to surpass $450 billion. This will create more than 2.5 million jobs in America. Actually, today you see more and more Chinese entrepreneurs investing in the United States and creating jobs. We have today about 240 pairs of sister states and cities and more than 90 dialogue and cooperation mechanisms that is between the governments. Later this year, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping will pay a state visit to the United States, and um, we are working very hard to prepare his visit, and I'm sure that this visit will yield a lot of substantive results. Our bilateral relations have certainly come a long way, as evidenced by the robust business ties and strong friendship between our peoples. However, I think at the policy level, there seem to be growing misgivings or even suspicions about China's moves, intentions, and development. A case in point is the misconception that China's rise poses a threat. This is where the Cold War mentality continues to cast its shadows on the relationship. China is a fully committed to a path of peaceful development. I think uh, Ambassador Cui said it very well last night. We know well that this is in our best interests, and our goals can only be realized in the peaceful international environment. 
The essence of our foreign policy has consistently been to foster win-win cooperation. With China's development, we can contribute more to world peace. In fact, China today is the largest contributor to UN peacekeeping operations of all the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Of course, differences exist between our two countries. This is only natural, as no countries are no. Uh, this is only natural, as no two countries are Siamese twins. As Confucius put it, harmony can exist in diversity. So we truly believe that the best thing for our two countries to do is working together for peace and harmony. Another example of the lack of understanding and trust is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, which I wanted to mention, by the way. This initiative has generated a lot of interest lately, as well as speculations. Some see it as China's attempt to take advantage of its neighbor's growing need for investment to seek its self-interest and wield its influence over other countries. And some portray the bank as a China-led challenge to the existing multilateral financial institutions and even hype up a rivalry between China and the United States. The establishment of the AIIB was proposed by President Xi Jinping during his trip to the Southeast Asia in 2013. It is aimed at enhancing the regional infrastructure, interconnectivity, and economic integration so that every country can share the benefits of economic development. The AIIB will fill the gap of existing financial institutions and help funnel more investment into the region. It complements rather than undercuts the existing institutions. So instead of taking the thunder out of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, the AIIB will provide additional sources of investment in infrastructure for countries in need. That the AIIB was proposed by China does not mean that it will be 100% Chinese. It will be jointly owned and operated by its future members. It is about propelling the economic development of the region rather than forming any kind of exclusive economic alliance. AIIB embodies the Chinese concepts of peace, development, and win-win cooperation. Over the years, China has been asked to play a bigger role in world affairs. I think AIIB and other initiatives like the One Belt and One Road are our latest answers to that call, because I think that with the development and the healthy uh, development and sustainable development of Asia and Eurasia as a whole, I think this is a good news for the world economy and world development. I talked about AIAB at relatively length simply to highlight the need for better mutual understanding between our two countries. I think this is really at the core of the new model of major country relationship our two presidents have agreed to build. This will be the greatest challenge that we must overcome in the years ahead. And to do that, we have to work together as facilitators, as communicators, and as bridge builders. And I think the Committee of 100 has done such a remarkable work in this area. And this year will be an extremely important year uh, for our bilateral relationship. And uh, as we are welcoming or, or preparing for the President's uh, state visit, my office will organize a number of events. We have many things on our schedule. Uh, for example, just take that as, as an example. Next month, a number of Chinese delegations composed of top publishing professionals and internationally acclaimed writers will come to New York to attend the Book Expo America. This year, the Book Expo America will uh, have China as the uh, guest of honor will feature uh, many of the Chinese uh, books and stories. And the Chinese uh, Central Ballet Academy and the Peking Opera Troupe will also be in town this summer, 
taking our cultural exchanges to a new level. These are only uh, just examples of many other events. I think these visits and events signal the deepening bonds of friendship that will continue to be nurtured between our two countries. The exchanges between our two cultures have intensified so much today that they can be seen in very small things. Recently, I have noticed that some changes in the fortune cookies that you will find in Chinese restaurants throughout the country. I don't know if I'm sure you have seen that as well. When you crack open one of the fortune cookies, you will not only find a Chinese proverb, which has been there for many, many years, even 40 years ago, I, I know that there was a Chinese proverb. But today, on the other side of the Chinese proverb, you will find a Chinese character with pinyin for you to pronounce. I don't know if you have realized that. And this point, I think this points to a higher interest and to the stronger willingness to learn about the Chinese culture in America. And this reminds me of a Belgian saying I learned when I was working in Brussels, that warm feelings come often through the stomach. Now we know why a fortune cookie is a must after a Chinese meal. And that perhaps also explains why people work better over meals and also probably explains why the Chinese like to eat so much especially during the Chinese uh, uh, spring festival season, the banquets could go on for several months, I find, especially here in uh, Manhattan. Um, so I wanted to end my uh, statement by, again, thank you so much for inviting me to today's lunch. And I'm sure our friendship and mutual understanding will be even stronger through today's lunch. And uh, again, bon appetit for your dessert. Thank you. Mm-hmm.